黎智英案正式开审。He will enjoy all the、uh, fair trial guarantees that、uh, are always extended to criminal suspects. Some of these people were very close to the United States, therefore they pay particular interest in the proceedings concerning them. 香港国安法与基本法第二十三条立法相辅相成。National security legislation in Hong Kong is milder than that in many other places. The United States, United Kingdom, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, they all have、uh, very draconian legislation. 风云对话专访英籍资深律师、香港前刑事检控专员江乐士。十二月十八日，国家主席习近平会见来京述职的香港特别行政区行政长官李家超，听取他对香港当前形势和特别行政区政府工作情况的汇报。李家超在述职后向媒体记者表示，将继续全力发挥“一国两制”下香港背靠祖国、连通世界的独特优势，团结爱国爱港的社会力量，积极融入国家发展大局。二零二零年六月三十日，全国人大常委会通过《香港国家安全法》。随着香港国安法的有效实施和选举制度的成功实践，香港进入由乱到治、走向由治及兴的新阶段。江乐士是英籍资深律师，香港特区政府律政司首任刑事检控专员。在任内，他带领刑事检控科加入国际检察官协会，提升了香港在世界的形象。修例风波期间，江乐士接受了许多西方媒体的采访，讲述香港的真实情况，在国际社会中为香港发声。Hello, Mr. Cross. It's great to have you here、um, at Phoenix headquarters, and thank you for coming to our show. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. This year marks the third anniversary of the national security law.、Um, you've worked as a criminal prosecutor in Hong Kong for decades,、uh, previously as the chief prosecutor. Would you please share with us what changes, what progress has taken place since the implementation of the national security law? Well, as you will remember, 2019, 2020 was a very difficult time indeed for Hong、yes. Kong. Uh, there was an insurrection here, and efforts were made to wreck the city itself、uh, and to destroy the one country, two systems policy.、Mm -hmm. uh, there was extreme violence, so it was a terrible time for many people in Hong Kong. There were serious fears that、uh, Hong Kong's way of life、uh, could be permanently destroyed. I mean, there were certainly people in other parts of the world who were supporting the people who were behind this.、Uh, and my own view is that the reason they were supporting it was that they they wanted to undermine China itself. Uh, they knew very well that if Hong Kong was successful, then this would reflect well on China.、Uh, equally, if Hong Kong failed, then this would look bad for China. And they were prepared to do that in, in order to undermine China's、uh, position、uh, on the world、like、stage. What was it like for the legal profession back then?、Um, well, as I, as I say, the, the legal profession also came under attack the,、right. at that time. The, the courts, for example, the、mm. uh, Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, which is、mm. our top court, the, uh, the uh, uh, Court of Appeal. The, the magistrates' court, the, the high court, they were all attacked by people、uh, with the fire bombs and, and wanting to undermine our legal system. Fortunately,、uh, it was not something that we, we'd experienced, certainly not、uh, in, 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 recent, in recent times. But our legal system survived. The judges and the lawyers, the prosecutors, kept、mm. their nerve,、uh, and、uh, we were able to come through. What did national security law do in、uh, 2020 when that was implemented? What happened to some of these people? Hong Kong. Under the Basic Law, was given responsibility、uh, for enacting national security legislation. This was a remarkable concession by the central authorities, because in every other jurisdiction of which I'm aware,、mm. national security laws are passed by national parliaments. Right. But the central government had great faith in Hong Kong,、uh, and they said to Hong Kong, as indeed they said to the Macau Special Administrative Region, that you can pass national security law on your own time in a way that suits your own your own particular needs. So we're talking about Article 23 legislation here, local contains, legislation. And,、uh, Now, when this was brought forward by the government in 2003,、uh, local、uh, anti-China elements whipped up opposition to it. They were、mm. supported by people abroad who tried、right. to make the people, local people, feel as fearful as possible, and the government withdrew it. And that didn't matter to start with, but in due course,、uh, as we saw、uh, mm. come 2019,、uh, there was a lacuna in the law, and Hong Kong lacked the laws it needed to protect itself from、uh, a violent insurrection. So、right. once the national security law was passed, the police finally had the tools they needed、uh, mm -hmm. in order to combat the the violence, the rioting, the insurrection,、uh, 
the, the fire bombing and so on, they were able to bring the situation under control mm. and Hong Kong was able to get back to normal again. Is Hong Kong back to normal now? Do people feel safe? Pretty well back to normal, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. people now feel safe, so things have very much returned to normal mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a great sigh of relief has been breathed by everyone who loves Hong Kong. From your perspective, is there still a risk of that type of black clad? violence back in 2019? Well, there's always a danger. Certainly, it, it, it's halted it in its tracks. Uh, mm. But uh, people, people in Hong Kong certainly can't be complacent. We still don't have the full plan panoply of national security laws that are envisaged by Article 23 uh, of the basic law. Uh, and uh, hopefully, they're going to be introduced uh, in the next year or so. Mm. Uh, but uh, so there is always a danger. We must always be on our guard. Uh, and we have seen cases that the, where the police have been arresting people for highly dangerous activities uh, and, uh, and uh, being taken to court accordingly. But it's at a far lower level than it ever was uh, in previous times when we faced that insurrection. Hong-Kong特别行政区基本法第二十三条是香港基本法中一条规定香港应自行立法维护中华人民共和国国家安全的法律条文。李家超在施政报告中提出，特区政府正全力研究基本法第二十三条的有效立法方案，落实特区政府应实践的限制责任。二零二四年内完成基本法第二十三条立法。now let's talk about uh, the local Article 23 legislation. Now how is that going? Do you think the Article 23 legislation is going to take place over the next year? I think that's uh, what well, we the, the, the government has indicated mm -hmm. that's that's its aspiration. Uh, so hopefully that will that will happen before too long, uh, because it's been talked about for so many years. And why did they do that? Well, the reason is simple: out of respect for the basic law, which is of itself uh, a uh, a national law of China. Yeah. And that national law of China, in Article 23, makes it clear that uh, Hong Kong itself has the responsibility for enacting those it those items of of national security uh, legislation. And so those are still outstanding because the National People's Congress didn't deal with that itself in 2020. So uh, Hong Kong now has to get on and fulfil its obligations, not only to itself, but to the rest of the country, mm -hmm. in terms of enacting the outstanding legislation, which covers uh, treason, uh, sedition, theft of state secrets, contacts with foreign political parties, uh, and this type of thing. Do you think that's enough to plug the loopholes in the system? We well, I think it will have? be. I mean, the... Uh, what we have so far since 2020, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, has led to a great de-escalation uh, of, of the problems that we faced, uh, yeah. and this will uh, complete the, the, the final gaps. And then everything will be completely in place, and, mm -hmm. and Hong Kong can then finally move on. I think there has been talks that Article 23 legislation is going to cover espionage. Has there previously been any cases relation to espionage in Hong Kong, or because of the lacuna there hasn't been? Mm. It was an open secret before 1997 that Hong Kong was being used uh, as, a, as a spy base by the British intelligence services, by the CIA uh, and, and others. They've obviously had to uh, scale back their activities uh, since 1997. Right. The, the US, for example, has relocated much of its uh, uh, spying activity uh, to Taiwan, so uh, where, where it's allowed to, to, to operate uh, and monitor uh, what's going on in China. So it, it definitely did, did exist before 1997. It's been scaled down now. Uh, and for the actual scale of it, I, I don't know, uh, because I'm not privy to. 近来针对今年七月香港警方向八名潜逃海外的反中乱港分子发出通缉令一事案件可谓是比比皆是一宗知名案例是美国动用间谍法的域外效力通缉危机解密创办人阿桑奇指控这位澳洲籍人士泄露了美国的国家机密而澳洲政府却从未声援阿桑奇意味对他的言论自由表示
uh, and uh, mm. 85 people had been convicted. 85, okay. 85. So these are very small figures. Yeah. I mean, when you consider the scale of the problem and the level of activity that has been going on, uh, this shows that uh, a, a very, uh, minim a very reasonable approach is being taken by the police force to, to, to bringing prosecutions. Mm -hmm. But many of the people who are arrested are not actually being prosecuted uh, at the end of the day because mm -hmm. restraint is being exercised and mm -hmm. only the clearest possible cases uh, are being taken forward. Uh, and that, uh, but nonetheless, a clear message is being sent out that uh, the, uh, the, the authorities are serious uh, in, in the worst cases about bringing prosecutions. Uh, and uh, this is obviously, I would have thought, reassuring to the community that knows that, uh, that can see that national security mm. is being taken seriously uh, mm. and that uh, uh, the situation that occurred before is not going to be allowed to happen again. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Cross, under the national security law, you previously stated traditional rights um, and liberties that are enjoyed by suspects under the common law are guaranteed. How does the national security law compare, say, with other national security laws from other parts of the world? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, uh, the national security law of Hong Kong uh, does put the rights of uh, criminal suspects front and center. Uh, for example, in Article 4, it stipulates that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, mm. which applies to Hong Kong under the basic law, uh, shall be protected uh, in, in the application of the mm. national security law. Uh, and what that means is that all the traditional uh, fair trial guarantees which suspects uh, enjoy in criminal cases are upheld. And uh, Article 5 goes on, for example, to make it absolutely clear what these sort of rights are. And it, they, it stipulates, for example, that the right to counsel uh, is, to be, uh, is to be upheld, the presumption of innocence uh, mm -hmm. in criminal trials is to be respected, uh, and that other traditional rights uh, are to be, be observed in the application of the national security law. And this, this contrasts with uh, legislation in other places, such mm -hmm. as the new legislation which has just come into effect in July in, in England, the National Security Act, it's called, which uh, gives the government very wide sweeping powers uh, mm. in relation to all matters of national security and has caused great concern in, for example, the journalistic community. Right. Uh, that makes no reference whatsoever of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, right. let alone the general rights uh, of suspects. It's clear, therefore, that when the uh, National People's Congress enacted the national security law, it wanted to go that extra mile to let people know that there's nothing to worry about in this new legislation. The traditional mm -hmm. rights which Hong Kong people have always enjoyed uh, under the common law uh, in relation to, to criminal trials are, are mm -hmm. protected uh, and that the only people who have anything to fear are the people who, uh, who, who, who contravene the law, whether by terrorism, whether by subversion, whether by trying to harm Hong Kong by, uh, by colluding with foreign forces uh, or by secession or whatever it may be. So is it correct to say that national security law is not as strict as a lot of the national security laws from around the world. It's well, not... it, it's mm -hmm. relatively mild. I mean, for example, in this part of the world, it's far milder than the legislation which exists in Singapore, okay. uh, in Malaysia, uh, and in Brunei. In Malaysia, for example, there's no provision for the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to mm -hmm. apply. Uh, people who are charged under it can be denied bail, uh, mm -hmm. no right to bail. Right. Um, and they even, they even have the death penalty, same mm. as in Singapore. They, they have a, a strict system of mm -hmm. uh, preventive detention mm -hmm. whereby people can be detained even without trial for mm -hmm. two years at a time. And this could be renewed uh, endlessly. Right. Uh, and they, again, do not apply the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights. They also retain the death penalty uh, mm -hmm. in national security cases. Mm -hmm. Both Malaysia and Singapore uh, have, have abolished trial by jury, not only in national security cases, but uh, across the board. So Hong Kong enjoys far greater liberalism, if I can put it that way, mm -hmm. in terms of national security. Jury trials are, are maintained in Hong Kong, even though in particular circumstances they could be limited. Mm -hmm. If there's a particular danger in a case of uh, national security mm -hmm. matters being disclosed or jurors being threatened. But in general, the jury system is alive and well. As you say, the, the, the system here is far milder than in many other places, including in this part of the world. But it just seems that Western media always portray this with a magnifying glass, saying, you know, this is the end of Hong Kong. There doesn't seem to be similar discussion about other countries. And well, you're absolutely right. Laws. I mean, the United Kingdom, for mm -hmm. example, has always criticised the national security law, uh, but it was previously responsible for Singapore, uh, for Malaysia uh, and for, for Brunei. Right. Uh, they were their territories just as Hong Kong once was. Uh, and even though the national security legislation in those three places, which were previously controlled by Britain, uh, is far more draconian than it is in Hong Kong, they never say a word about it.
And this is quite clearly part of a, a, an international plan which has been hatched, I'm sure, by the United States and its Five Eyes partners to demonize the national security law in Hong Kong, to put Hong Kong uh, in, a, in a bad light as a way of trying to discredit China. That's the only possible explanation there is for it. And indeed, if you look at the United States, it also has uh, highly draconian laws for national security. It has about 20 of them. As of February of this year, there were 31 suspects being held in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, uh, for on alleged terrorism charges uh, without charge. And they've been held there for years. They're just rotten in Guantanamo Bay. They have the audacity to criticize Hong Kong's arrangements, which would never tolerate any such situation. And likewise with the, I mean, as a journalist yourself, you'll have been following the case of Julian Assange. I mean, all he did was, as, as, a, as an investigative journalist, was to reveal malfeasance at mm -hmm. the heart of the U.S. government, right. including the abuse of prisoners uh, by U.S. personnel uh, in Afghanistan uh, and the horrors that are going on Guantanamo in Guantanamo Bay. Bay. And for that, he is being pursued, persecuted by the American authorities. He's now rotting in, a, in Belmarsh Prison in London, fighting expeditions to the United States. Heaven knows if he's ever sent back to the United States, mm. what sort of fate he will face. But he's doing his level best to, to resist it, and uh, we'll have to see what happens. But uh, as I say, it's a, it's a classic example of, mm -hmm. what, of what we say in England is the pot calling the kettle black. Arrangements in the United States are far more draconian than anything in Hong Kong, and yet they use this all the time to try and demonize Hong Kong as a way of embarrassing China.十二月十八日，香港一传媒创办人、反中乱港分子黎智英涉嫌串谋勾结外国势力危害国家安全案件，在香港西九龙裁判法院正式开审，审理过程预计八十天。在黎智英案件中，他曾聘用英籍律师欧文赴港代表他抗辩，香港律政司三度上诉，均无功而还。特首李家超因此向人大常委会提请释法。在去年十二月底，人大常委会释法，定名不具有香港全面职业资格的海外律师或大律师参与国安案件，必须取得特首发出的证明书，否则国家安全委员会应当介入，对该等情况作出判断和决定。So tell us please, what are some of the cases that are about to go on trial, national security law cases, or? Are now under trial that have attracted the most attention in Hong Kong. Obviously, the the case of Jimmy Lai Chi Ying, the media magnate, Apple Daily. Uh, who's, mm -hmm. That's right, from Apple Daily, who's facing uh, various charges, including colluding with foreign powers to mm. uh, endanger national security. That is coming up in in December, right. uh, and that is uh, attracting a lot of attention. But again, mm. he will enjoy all the. Uh, fair trial guarantees that mm. uh, are always extended to criminal suspects. A fair outcome, I have no doubt, will be achieved uh, in due course. Mm -hmm. But the, some of these people that I've mentioned were very close to the United States, for example, uh, and uh, therefore they pay particular uh, interest uh, in, 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 their, in the proceedings concerning mm. them. In the Jimmy Lai case, I think there is an issue about uh, counsel. Well, that's recently been mm. discussed in mm. the media. Mm. I mean, what outcome do you think is going to come out of that? Hong Kong has a very unusual system whereby, because mainly for historical links, for historical reasons, uh, overseas barristers are allowed to come and conduct cases uh, in, uh, in, in Hong Kong uh, if, there's a, if there's a good reason for them doing so, uh, which is normally there isn't uh, the necessary expertise available here in Hong Kong. This is a, a, a remarkable uh, arrangement because most other places do not have it. I mean, the United States doesn't allow foreign lawyers to come in and practice in particular cases. The United Kingdom doesn't allow it. Uh, uh, Australia doesn't allow it. Canada doesn't allow it. But as I say, primarily for historical reasons, Hong Kong allows that uh, if there's a good cause for bringing in a foreign lawyer to represent uh, a defendant. But the view was taken that Another in national... example of the freedom that uh, the Hong Kong judiciary well, the, I mean, the legal the, system the, enjoys, well, the, I suppose. If a criminal suspect wants to bring in a, a, a foreign lawyer to defend him, it has to be approved by the judiciary. And the judge has to be uh, convinced that there's a good ground for doing so, which will normally be, as I say, that the necessary expertise is not available here in Hong Kong. Right. So that's a remarkable concession. But the view was taken that in national security cases, it might be dangerous to bring in foreign lawyers mm -hmm. because they will get access to national security information, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which would place them in an invidious position 
if when they return to, to UK or anywhere else, uh, the, the, the intelligence agencies ask them mm. about that information. They would put in a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, and there's always a danger if, case, if materials relating to the cases are sent to London, for example, right. uh, prior to the trial, because uh, unauthorised uh, people might get access to it. So in order, to, uh, in order to protect that type of information, certain restrictions have been placed on foreign lawyers coming in to do those type of cases. But this is not a concern at all, because all it means is that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the particular suspect has to choose a lawyer who is qualified here in Hong Kong and practices here in Hong Kong, which is exactly the same arrangement as applies in most of the, if not all, the common law, common law countries. Uh, and indeed, I should emphasize as well that many foreign lawyers do actually live in Hong Kong and practice in Hong Kong, and there's no restriction on them conducting these type of cases. Yeah. It's only foreign lawyers who are resident overseas that have restrictions placed on them uh, in terms of conducting mm. national really security plenty law of cases. Choice. Oh, that's a very plenty, big choice, yeah. yeah. There's a very large, mm -hmm. very large bar. Uh, yeah. here in Hong Kong, hundreds of barristers they can choose from. And as I say, they, they could be local or they could be overseas lawyers who live and practice here in Hong Kong. Uh, so there's absolutely no, no area of concern on that. The rule of law, you've said many times on uh, previous occasions, is one of the secrets to mm. Hong Kong's success. And we have an independent judiciary, a very strong legal profession and respect for legal traditions. Our, our judges, as I mentioned earlier, uh, are at the apex of our legal system. Uh, and they've mm. done a wonderful job, by all accounts, uh, since uh, 1997. Right. The Court of Final Appeal itself comprises permanent judges from Hong Kong and also overseas judges. I think there are currently now 11 overseas judges on our Court of Final Appeal. And they come from the United Kingdom, they come right. from uh, Canada, and mm -hmm. they come from Australia. Some of them are former chief justices as well. So these are people of very highest quality. Uh, and they bring their huge experience to Hong Kong. Mm. And this, of course, is why pressure has also been placed on those overseas judges to leave the Court of Final Appeal by the very people who want to undermine our, our legal system. And you may remember last year that uh, uh, in, in March of last year, two senior serving judges uh, from mm. the United Kingdom were actually pressurised uh, into resigning by the then Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, who said that... Uh, uh, their, their presence in our Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal was, in, was incompatible with international legal standards. But because they were still serving in the United Kingdom Supreme Court, they really had to take notice uh, and they resigned. But the other judges, who are retired judges, can't be pressurised in that way. They have made it clear that uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the uh, legal system in Hong Kong, that it's working perfectly satisfactorily, uh, and that there's no interference whatsoever with the decisions of the judiciary, which, of course, is the very last thing that the uh, Hong Kong's critics uh, in the United States, the United Kingdom and elsewhere uh, want to hear, which is why they're also trying to pressurize them into resigning. 早在一九七八年，江乐士就开始在香港从事刑事检控工作。一九九七年，他成为了香港特区政府律政司首任刑事检控专员，见证了香港始终保持司法独立，并在民主发展等领域不断取得进步。面对西方近年来对香港事务的无理指责和干预，他用自己的经历向世界讲述真实的香港，回击不实言论和造谣诽谤。You came to Hong Kong in 1978. You've called Hong Kong home. What's your love for Hong Kong? I mean, what's the story? What's the opportunity that brought you here? Well, you're right. It's, uh, it's actually 45 years this week since I, since right. I landed at the, the old Kai Tech airport. But I was working in London. I was a, a very young lawyer. I was prosecuting in London for the Customs and Excise Department. Uh, and then one day there was an advertisement in the Times for a prosecutor in Hong Kong on what was uh, a two and a half year contract in the old Attorney General's chamber. Really, a newspaper advert? Oh yeah, in the employment columns of the, of, the, of the Times for two and a half years in Hong Kong as a prosecutor in the Attorney General's department, now the Department of Justice. So I went out for two and a half years. Within a very short time, I was doing cases at the highest level, murder cases, robbery cases, rape cases, in front of juries, which, are, which is an opportunity I would never have had had I stayed in England until in my 40s, you see. So it's a marvellous opportunity, very good career move. And I fell in love with the place. The people were very kind to me. I like the food. Uh, I like the atmosphere. I like the can-do spirit. Uh, and I decided to stay. When you were the chief prosecutor, your counterpart in the Hong Kong police uh, was John Lee, who's now the chief executive of Hong Kong. You used to work closely, um, I read. We worked very closely with, mm. with John Lee, yes. Uh, he was head of 
crime and, and security in right. the Hong Kong police force. Mm. I was the director of public prosecutions, so we used to meet regularly to, to map out anti-crime strategies, and our teams would meet together, sorting out any, any problems that we were having in our relationship. What and, uh, was your impression of him? Well, he was an easy man to get on with. He could be hard and tough when necessary. Uh, he had certain views on things, mm. uh, quite firm views at times, but mm. uh, he was accommodating. He was always open to persuasion. I mean, if you had a good case, uh, then uh, he would be the first to acknowledge it. Uh, but you had to justify your position if you wanted to say this, we should do this rather than this. But as I say, yes, he was a, he was a decent man to work with. And uh, by and large, we solved any problems that, that came our way. And he's been serving as the chief executive of Hong Kong for about a year now. Absolutely. How do yes. you look at the achievements he's made? He's indicated the, the path that he wants to follow. He's a determined man. He hasn't been pushed around by anybody. He's uh, decided what he wants to achieve. He's got a clear vision. So far as I can tell, uh, he's achieving it. Uh, he's set out uh, clear areas where there have to be improvements, whether in terms of housing or elsewhere, livelihood matters. Uh, and he's uh, insisting that uh, his ministers do all they can to, to deliver on those. This is uh, very gratifying, I would have thought. As he was a police officer, I was, I was a bit concerned about how he would adjust to this type of you know, political environment. But he's obviously adjusted to doing extremely well, very, very adaptable. What's your message for Hong Kong's development going forward, especially under the one country, two systems principle? Well, business as usual. Uh, we're going from strength to strength. Our financial uh, stability is being recognised. Uh, companies are coming back here. The, the rule of law is as strong as ever. Uh, we are standing up for ourselves and China is supporting us on the international stage. Uh, and it's uh, progress on all fronts. And with the new opportunities that I mentioned earlier opening up within China itself, particularly uh, in the Great Bay Area, there's actually no reason why Hong Kong's uh, future should not be even brighter than it has been in the past.